the Know Your Gear podcast. Hey everyone, how's it going? Welcome to the Know Your Gear podcast live, episode 357. And I hope everyone had a fantastic week. And uh, I'm excited. I hope you guys are excited. We got a lot of stuff to talk about, a lot of guitar stuff to talk about, which is probably good for a guitar channel to, t- <laughs> to have. Um, <laughs> anyways, uh, of course, we're going to be doing some fun stuff like we always do. And uh, what? Announcements. Let's do announcements. What do I have? I don't think I have much announcements. Do I? I have under announcements, it says, let everybody know about merchandise. <laughs> That's what, it just, that's what it says. Um, so uh, during the week, I make notes for the show. So the note is, hey, there's new merchandise. So check it out. Uh, there, you, there you go. I hope that's, I hope that, uh, <laughs> there, buy stuff. I guess that was the announcement. Okay. Uh, as always, I want to thank everybody for coming live. And uh, if you see somebody with a uh, blue name and a check mark, or sorry, a wrench that means our moderator here to help you and uh, uh, sift me questions and post links and do all the stuff that they do that's awesome that helps this show happen and of course you see somebody in a green name that means they're a member and they're supporting the channel just like the patrons this is a totally member patron sponsored podcast and has been for 357 proud episodes i'm really really proud of that um Uh, Because I'm still in shock that it's lasted this long, that people are still sponsoring it this long. So, uh, oh, I guess one announcement I could make is thank you so much. This is basically in the month. We're not going to talk until until April. Uh, the second channel, Film Ignite 2, was launched, and uh, it, it now we're putting pod clips and other little clips and other little bonus pod clips and stuff, our podcasts over there and stuff. And first month we tried to push this was this month, the month of March. And in the month of March, we are closing up on 1 million views on that channel and over 15,000 subscribers, uh, which is just amazing thank you for that it's overwhelming support over there it's like in fact that's where i spend all my time reading the comments and looking because i feel like there's a lot it seems like it's just happening a bunch of activity okay so uh let's see uh let's let's uh get into stuff (laughs) Let's see. Should I do early questions? Yeah, let's do an early question. Okay, so one of the first questions I saw our subject was from Gina Short, who says, do you have any thoughts, experience on the Vega trim for Telecasters? I don't. I I have not tried that uh, bridge. Now, Andre Flood, Dr. Andre Flood, did a uh, video of, I guess, the first version they did. And, uh, you know, I could read the situation wrong. It's not, it's hard to read in an email or a DM format but uh, the guys at Vega Trend who, who have been very supportive of the channel over the years and I've been supportive back because their products are very cool um, sent me a message about the Vega Trim Telecaster bridge and I messaged them back saying yeah I saw that you know the first version wasn't very good and I saw Andre's uh, you know review of it and then they disappeared so I think I upset them it's possible <laughs> bringing that up that the first version had flaws i think they said I, they did message me back i just don't remember what it was but it ended with obviously uh you know i'm not doing a review of the bridge so that's uh gina that's what happened with that so unfortunately um and you know barring something happening in the future nothing's on the on the books so to speak uh so there you go uh luis says uh says what does he say? He says, Guitar Max just posted about lead contamination, contamination, contamination on cheap Chinese question mark guitars. I like how you put Chinese guitars. And I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, it says, any guesses as to how common that would be for guitars sold today? So I watched uh, Guitar Max's uh, video of that um, because obviously I was curious, like all of you. So if you don't know, uh, check out his channel. If you don't know Guitar Max, he's great. Um one of my favorite things, and, and I never want to upset him, this guy works out like a madman, and he is he is not the person I want to make angry, even though he's like a sweet guy, just not the guy. But I got to tell you that I got to hang out with him and uh, a couple times, but more importantly, I got to hang out with him once at, in, <laughs> over in Europe, and Pete Thorne was there, and I had a moment where they were talking to me within a few minutes of each other, and I realized they have the same voice. And so I was dumb enough to tell them, I said, I think you guys have doppelganger voices. You guys have that same, and I meant it as a, a so you know, I t- truly mean it as a compliment. They have the coolest voices. I mean, I have this high, you know, 
stupid voice. They had those cool voices, and I was like, really cool. And then I just thought it was weird that they sounded alike. So uh, I just thought I'd share that with you. Of course, it was really dumb because I don't think they, I don't know if they didn't like it or not. I didn't get the impression they didn't like it. I just they didn't probably find it as entertaining as me. So back to Guitar Max. Uh, so Guitar Max, great channel. Check him out. If you don't know his channel, you probably do because he has 200,000 subs. And uh, so he did a video where he uh, did a uh, kind of like if you saw this thing with the cups, the Stanley cups, you know, people on TikTok and stuff and they were testing their cups and they're like, there's lead in this and stuff like that. And so he tested some guitars. So ironically, he tested three guitars and the results did not shock me at all one bit, which was one guitar was a, I think it was a Tiesco, uh 60s era guitar, was probably made in Japan. Uh, I don't remember him saying, but it is probably was made in Japan. Uh, guitar. So obviously, uh, he said that perfectly said he said that, you know, during that time frame, they you know, they I mean, when I was a young lad, <laughs> uh, I played with this, um, you know, those little army green army men. Well, I had a little like lead one that my, was my grandfather's. It was, uh, I thought it was an army man. That's why I played with it. It wasn't an army man. It was like a hunting, a hunter with a rifle. And it was, the whole thing was lead. Um, and uh, yeah, I played with that all the time. So that explains a lot of things for me now. But anyways, uh, so yeah, different times, different, you know, different world. Uh, and then the two that failed out of his 70 guitars were the two Chipsons, an Ibanez Chipson, which had it in the pickup bobbins, um, and then a, uh, a Chipson uh, Les Paul, which I had it in the frets. And all I want to say to that is, you know, it's a video. It's like, look, when you make a thousand videos, some are great, some are bad. Some people get them, some people don't. And there's ones that you really feel proud of. There's a video I've been proud of for so long. And it's just this video that's just, I got probably the most raking over the coals. And it was when uh, a friend of mine bought, uh, he thought he was buying a real uh, Mayanez guitars, uh, Mayanez guitar. And he bought it on OfferUp. And the guy told him he's getting divorced and he has to get rid of it by tomorrow because they're coming to uh, inventory the, the house. I don't think I told this story in the video because I'll tell you why in a second. So, <laughs> so anyways, uh, this guy posts on offer up, Hey, I got to get rid of all my high end guitars. I'm getting divorced with my wife's lawyers get here in the morning. They're inventory in the house, you know, all dirt cheap. They got to go. And so my friend was like, Oh wow, what a deal. And he, he had never played like a high end guitar like that. And, uh, so he went there and he bought the guitar for uh, probably like 800 bucks. I can't, I can't remember. I remember it was a lot for what it was. And when he got it, he was playing it and he was like, wow, this doesn't play that great. And then that turned into, wow, this doesn't look that great. And he asked me to come take a look at it. So he actually brought it to me, brought it to me. And I took a look at it and I said, yeah, this is fake. This is a, this is a Chinese knockoff fake guitar. And I said, uh, so you want me to fix it up and set it up? And he said, no, and uh, he goes, no, d just throw it in the trash. You know, he was upset. And I said, well, let's not throw it in the trash. I mean, it has value. So I said, let's, um, let me fix it up and I'll take the logos off and I will give it to some, you know, somebody who wants a guitar, right? Let's just give it away. Why, why destroy it if we can give it away? And he was like, no, because he was obviously upset because he just got duped out of $800. And he was like, uh, and I don't think he didn't want me to tell the story at the time because I'm sure he, you know, he's a little embarrassed by it, which he has no reason to be. I mean, I understand, you know, things happen. But um, especially since he's a really smart guy, <laughs> it happens to everybody. I don't care what anybody says. Everybody's like, I would never fall for it. Nah, you know, smart people get make dumb decisions all the time, too. So um, so anyways, what happened was I said, I will burn fake into it. I'll remove the logos and I will burn fake into these guitars. And so that's what I did. And that's the video that everybody remember. Like, why did you burn fake into it? You ruined, you didn't have to go that far. And the whole point was like, we just didn't want anybody to ever try to repurpose this guitar and put the logos back and change it back into a fraud guitar again. I'm going to call it a fraud guitar now, um, from now on, because since that slipped out. So all those chips and guitars, I've always had a hard stance on them. They are the thing that I hate most. I, you've never heard me complain that Harley Benton copies a Les Paul or that, you know, some company copies this copy. You've never heard me complain about copies. Like I said, I don't, I don't really care as long as the consumer is not being taken advantage of, unless, as long as the consumer can identify what they're buying and make an educated or even a barely educated guess, I think there is no uh, issue there. That's why I always say trademarks and it should be to protect customers more so than companies. It's not about making a company, you know, make it impossible for anyone to make something innovative in the future. It's to make sure that fake companies, you know, fraud 
can't be committed on consumers. And and chips and guitars are fraud, not only in what they do, but exactly this, you know, and there's a reason why, um, and I wish everyone would do it. I re reason why Paul Reed Smith Guitars, and I think Reverend now does it too, or they did it as well, put the name of who builds the guitars off their import guitars on their headstock. They, they do that, you know, if you watch the bonus podcast I did on my other channel with Jack Higginbotham, who runs SE Guitars for PRS, he said it best. We want them to have ownership of these guitars. He, he says, I want them to have pride. Now, that is his, as a CFO <laughs> of Paul Reed Smith Guitars, that is the way he's going to put that. And I think that's perfectly put the way he put it. However, I would go a step further and say, I'm going to make them responsible for what they do. That's really what I'm going to say. Like when you get a Paul Reed Smith SE and you know now who built it, when there's a problem like lead in your frets, you're going to, instead of going to PRS, you're going to be able to identify the company who did it. And so when you share ownership like that, I think it's a, a better way of doing things. And and that's why I'm always skeptical of of all the companies that, you know, the com these knockoff companies where they put the fake brands and fake logos on them. And that's why I'm skeptical of import brands that contact me all the time. And I, as you know, I know I did RJ Guitars this week. It was a, you know, that's why I went to the de to go into detail on whether or not it was actually Bone when they said it was. Was it actually the things they said it was? It's a new company. They sell them on Amazon. You, ha you know, that's why I do that. So, you know, just for the record... Um, when I heard, I just want to be clear, when I heard that there's a hundred dollar guitar coming on the market with stainless steel frets and bone nuts, I absolutely took it. My first fastest opportunity, I reviewed that guitar. I did a detailed deep dive review and I put it on the internet. I did not get paid a single dime for that. Of course they sent me the guitar, but so you understand if anyone lives local and wants it, DM me. I don't want a guitar, a hundred dollar guitar. I don't need another guitar around the house. Um, I did it because... I just know what they're going to do. They're going to flood us with, these are great, can't believe them videos. And I was like, let's put it on the deep dive. Let's do it now. Before I get 50 emails going, I bought a $100 guitar and it's not what they said. So I, I tested it. It was what they said. So good for them. It had some issues, but it was still what they promised. And this all ties in back to Guitar Max. And I thought that was a great way of him testing frets and testing things and Obviously, you can buy those test kits, I think, on Amazon and test your own guitars if you're concerned about it. And uh, and this is where I and I'm a little, you know, I'm a little hot as I would be in this subject matter, because this is where I always hear stuff of people who have no idea what they're talking about, posting stuff all the time like this is a sweatshop and this is this and no one knows. And that's the that's the whole point. You have to test things. You have to show things. And um and, and hopefully we all learn what we're really looking at. You know, um, somebody, they always put, I, I've said this before, I, said, I feel like a broken record. I said this a few episodes ago, maybe 10 episodes ago. Every time I review a Chinese made super inexpensive guitar, somebody says, this is sweatshop labor. This is this, this is horrible. And I always go, well, how do you know? Help me figure it out. What, it, what proof did you get? I will share it with the world. I'll share it. I have a platform. Let's share it. But really what's interesting is those people never have, they have zilch to say when the brand names are doing the same thing and just marking it up and paying marketing and, and distribution, and, right? The reality is, I hate to say it, if you, don't, if you don't know, when you buy a $600 made in China guitar, it probably can be sold for $100 as well. It's just by the time they pay marketing, by the time they pay a little extra time in fit and finishing and are in uh, and QA when it, a quality assurance when it gets here to the United States or to Europe and it goes through the process, by the time they give the dealers a cut, by the time they right they tr they ship it three times versus the once or twice it's going to get shipped, um, you're looking at the same guitar. So um, I would love uh, I always say this and because I, I know I have so many viewers out there I would love um, to uh, if you have information about stuff like that, please share it. But just saying wild accusations doesn't mean anything. Um, that's why I test every guitar the same, whether it's a $6,000 guitar or it's a $100 guitar or it's a $60 guitar or $300 guitar. They all get the same test. They all get the same process. At least you can see what I see and we'll, we'll come to, you come to your own conclusion about it. But yeah, I love the video, by the way. Guitar Max's video was great and did not shock me at all that the companies that won't even put their own brand name on it sure as hell are pulling shady stuff. That would be the, that would be the takeaway because who really is responsible? Who would you even go after? Let's say you got sick. 
Who would you go after for that? They don't even put their brand in. You don't even know what factory made it or if that factory exists a month later. So, Blues Man for you. I like that. It says, triple question mark. says, what about Ert? E-Art guitars. I always say it wrong. E-Art guitars. Are they real stainless steel? Those guitars, you know, like I said, look, if I said yes, then they could change them tomorrow and then you would be, you know, I don't know. But here's what I can tell you. I have purchased three E-Art guitars. They have sent two guitars uh, to the channel. And one of the guitars, we did test the frets by removing a few of them and cutting them and doing some stuff. And we were modding that guitar. In fact, it was for a friend and those were stainless steel frets. In my opinion, those were stainless steel frets. Um, like I told you guys, uh, I think you guys, I talked about uh, getting a test kit to test for stainless steel. So many guys reached out. So many of you reached out, uh, some engineers reached out. Everybody reached out, give me some great information. I did all, I, I re- literally researched every single thing that made any sense at all. And what I found was one person had the right answer and the, the right answer sucked, <laughs> which was you need this $20,000 machine to test. Um, that seemed about the most. And then even then it gets a little gray area of what, um, you know, what, what it is you got. Um, like I said, the only way I know how to truly test for a um, stainless steel fret is to cut it because I have snip it, in other words. And the reason is, is because I've, uh, you know, it's to refret one guitar is about six feet of fret wire. So, uh, you know, maybe I need to figure that out one day, how many refrets I've done in my life and buy that feet, but thousands of feet, <laughs> uh, when you, when you snip, you know, when you've done something a thousand times, you know, you kind of have a sense of what it feels like or what it, you know, what it is. And so I can tell when I cut something, um, sometimes I can tell when I file on them, although that gets a little suspect too. Um, it gets a little tricky. So it's a little tricky, man. It's tough. Um, yeah, David says all those Amazon-based brands are simply cutting out the middleman with varying degrees of success and failures. Uh, absolutely. So, so you so you're aware. Um, I have worked with so many of those, uh, you know, those Amazon-based brands. And and, and I, when I say work with, I want to be very clear. I have worked with. I've done some videos, and I've actually worked with them like on a marketing. Uh, level because they, you know, companies reach out all the time. They they uh, reach out to me and they say, hey, look, I have some questions and I have some ideas and, you know, I'd like to pay you for your time. And um, and I've worked with, as you guys know, many, uh, many other brands. And every time I've ever discussed the strategy of the, and I like perfectly put, uh, David, the Amazon-based brands, that's literally what I call them, even though they have nothing to do with Amazon. I always call them the Amazon brands. Every time I've ever explained how the Amazon brand business model is working now to a real legitimate brand, and I kind of just, I want to use language that un- illustrates what I'm saying. I'm not trying to be hurtful. Um, those those brands almost immediately are in shock. They're like, what are you talking about? I go, I go, yeah, this is how it works. This is how they're making money, and this is how fast they're making money, and this is how they're doing it. And I it, it found, it made me, um, it always makes me, chuckle a little bit how the main brands don't understand these how smart this business strategy is in the terms of making money because it's they can drop the price so low but they don't care what the price is in fact uh this is a true story this week i was working with a a very large brand (laughs) okay very large brand and I was explaining the, that, the strategy. And one of the things I said to him was I said, let's say you had an import line and you wanted to sell them for $600 a piece. You know, you could set up a strategy with influencers and Amazon to where you sell them for $200 a piece. Well, obviously, you know, you want to sell them for $600. Um, let's say your cost is four. You're losing $200 per guitar. But as you sell, Amazon will raise the price to $300. Then you're only losing $100. And then it will raise the price to $400. And then it'll raise the price to $500. And each time it's doing that, it's doing that by the volume of sales. And by the time it's done, you won't be charging $600. You'll be charging $750. Because instead of you doing what you've done, which is picked a price and go, I think I could sell them for $600. Amazon has set it up in a strategy where literally, you know, the hype has gone crazy. And now people are on the top end of that price point. So many of you have seen this, which is why I always tell you anytime we're dealing with Amazon-based brands, I shouldn't say base because again we're not saying they're part of Amazon, but they're using the Amazon platform. I tell you all the time, if you see a YouTuber mention the guitar or the product and you think it looks interesting, 
and the price looks good and you wait and you see the price goes up, wait. As soon as the hype goes, the, 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 the system drops pricing again. It's really, really fast. So uh, I know that's more market stuff, but this week was a heavy market week for me. I was doing a lot of marketing work. So with companies more so than YouTuber work. So maybe my mind's in that genre, uh, framework now. Um, Google Dog says, I've been getting rid of some guitars lately and your experience do stores give higher value for guitars as trade-ins on something in the store or as outright purchases. Well, there's an old saying and it says, don't bring sand to the beach. Look, anytime you're bringing guitars to a guitar store, you have to understand that if you're not bringing them something they want or need, it has no value to them. There's very few, very few exceptions to that. Now, when I say few, I mean, even the employees or the owners could like, wow, you have a, I've always wanted that guitar and they're kind of want to buy it so they can get it personally, but that's rare. Most of the time, what you have, they've seen it you know, a thousand times over and they know if they can sell it or not and how fast they can sell it, how, how desirable. So th that's the problem. The problem is this, if they do want to give you a good amount of money for it, it's probably because it's very desirable. You probably get more money if you just don't go to them. So uh, in my in my experience when trading in, so yes, you will get in on most businesses, most stores, whether they're chains or uh, mom and pops, most businesses will give you more for trade than cash value because of course they don't have to take cash out of hand for that and that's really nice for them um and then also they can kind of like logically figure out how they're gonna you know they make a little bit more money playing with you know versus giving you a hundred dollars cash versus giving you a hundred dollars worth of product that costs them 70 bucks or 60 bucks and then sometimes you when you're dealing with a mom and pop you can understand there's more to a strategy than that you might pick their the magical you know uh, item so in other words if you came with some stuff and you said hey i really want to trade for that one guitar that's two thousand dollars they might have three hundred dollars in that guitar they might have been a score of the century and so their brain their brain's gonna go well i'm into it for 300 bucks if i buy all this guy's stuff for 300 bucks i can sell his stuff for 2500 ah, deal so there is a little of that so what i'm trying to say is yes a little bit better on trade um but those are the factors you want to factor in you want to factor in the fact that anytime you're dealing with a business they're only thinking like a business and you know so you could probably still get better deal if you sell independently, but um, I've I've done it both, and it just depends on how I feel. Sometimes I'm just not in the mood to meet somebody at the Guitar Center parking lot or the Walmart's parking lot. <laughs> just I just there's just I know I can get a hundred dollars more. I just can't get my head to go. You know I don't want to do it, so I'll go trade. You know or go sell. Um, I will preferably trade. Uh, more than sell. So, you know, um, usually the the rule I follow with trade, I get I did a, a podcast where I said like the three rules of trade, but the, the bear that down so we don't have to repeat it. The With me, you know your win in a trade when you walk away with less stuff than you came with. Um, so what I mean by that is if you brought three Squires, a Harley Benton and an Aria Pro and you walk out with, you know, a main USA Strat, you won. Right. That's how I look at that. That's usually how it works with a lot of trades like, like, you know, baseball cards, stuff like that. You know, usually you're trying to trade up to a bigger thing. So trading a bunch of, of lower price stuff for one nicer thing usually works to your favor. Of course, there's exceptions to that, but I'm saying, generally speaking, that's the strategy. Um, what I have done in the past that was really well, I didn't know it was going to happen. You know, obviously I didn't know COVID was going to happen. Um, but what happened with me that happened during COVID was I had an insane amount of stuff, <laughs> uh, maybe 30 guitars, 20 amplifiers and 200 pedals, something like that. All of this stuff would be lower mid price, really lower mid price stuff. And just because it was so much of it, it would be just so hard to be listing on Craigslist and Reverb. I went, every time I went to a store uh, here in Arizona or in California, I would walk in a store and I would ha I would see something and I'd go, oh, that's like a, you know, a Gibson Explorer or a Gibson uh, Les Paul. It was usually a lot of times Gibsons. I ended up with a ton of Gibsons. But, you know, something that was cool that I thought was reasonably priced used. Like, wow, that's a really good price on that SG. Like I think it could sell for 1200 bucks and they only want eight. That's a good deal. I would bring them uh, $800 worth of stuff that I didn't want. And I would take that guitar. And then when COVID happened, I had about 20 high-end guitars that I got to sell for top dollar. So I probably took, you know, 
10 grand worth of stuff and turned it into 30 grand. I wish I was, you know, that's so, I mean, it's crazy, right? And so you can do that. So a lot of times that's my process of thinking is if I have a bunch of stuff, I will consolidate into one nice thing that I know will continue to raise in value. Again, like I said, I don't really love this conversation, these conversations. I want to be clear with that. I've never been into the guitar flipping idea. Um, I hope like you, it's just mostly like I I make a lot of purchases because I'm addicted to this stuff. And then sometimes I have stuff and I'm like, what do I do? These are the solutions that work for me. And so I'm just sharing them with you. But, um, you know, the big problem, you guys, uh, you, you know, you if you watch YouTube, you, you see it, right? Uh, I did an interview, I think it was during COVID, and uh, <laughs> and it was with a, a like a, I think it was with Business Week or something. I don't know. I'm in the article in the magazine, and uh, they interviewed me, and we were discussing things, and the uh, conversation and the interview went really south really fast. This went crazy. And the reason why is when he called me, he called me because he was given my name by somebody. And he was like, yeah, I, I know, you know, I want to talk to you about people. It was because of COVID because it was about buying guitars. Anyways, this reporter was talking to me about buying guitars and, you know, and how many guitars is too many guitars. And, you know, that's what he wanted to know and collecting and when is collecting hoarding. And, and in the middle of the discussion and the very short, the short part of the first discussion, I said, well, keep in mind, I'm corrupted because you know, I do 50 to 100 videos a year. And if only half of that product is sent to me by companies, I mean, I got 50 guitars to deal with every year. That's not really like I'm collecting them. They're just companies send them and then companies like to exchange that for the work. They don't want to pay you in money. And then you have to convert that back to money, as you guys see with, you know, YouTube channels, especially pedal channels. They got to constantly be getting sent pedals and they sell the pedals off because uh, that's how they're funding this, their business, their enterprise, their entrepreneurship. So I said, so a lot of times it gets confusing. And I said, even my audience gets confused when I, even I'm talking on the podcast, like there's guitars here. And then there's like, there's just stuff that's collecting up and, and I, and it gets away from me fast. I've seen, um, I have talked to YouTubers. That's how I, I know it can get crazy. I've talked to YouTubers been doing this 10 years who told me that, you know, they have 300 guitars sitting around and they're like, I don't, yeah. They're like, I just, you know, I just keep putting them away. <laughs> just putting them away going, I don't, I'll get to it. I'll eventually get rid of some of this stuff. It's, uh, it's crazy. So, uh, but of course, when I say that about those certain channels, you know that they're making really good money because they're not, they don't have to sell off the stuff. So it's pretty, it's pretty nuts. Uh, that's why I always tell you guys on my personal collections, there is set numbers. There's only so many things I'll have in my personal thing. If something comes in, something goes out. Uh, Okay, hold on a second. Um, I think it's Napalm. Napalm1334 says, uh, how do you feel about your PRSCE hollow body? Uh, I, uh, oh, the semi hollow. Okay. Uh, I almost bought one the other day. Hard choice uh, between that and the S2 CE24. So I have a, I have a, a CE hollow body behind me. I'm pointing it right now. And then off behind me, again, I have a Simi Hollow S2. Uh, I prefer the Simi Hollow S2 over the CE uh, for tone, for playability, for everything. I like it better. Um, I bought a CE uh, Simi Hollow literally to save weight. And then it's been on the chop shop and it's probably going to. Um, there was a bunch of guitars. I, I just offloaded a bunch of stuff in February and... Uh, we ran out of boxes and we ran out of ability to even ship anything anymore because we sold so much stuff. The patrons bought up so we, I, when I, uh, I don't want to get too carried away with this, but when I decide off, so I'll offload stuff, what we do is we send it to the patrons by level. So the more the patrons have tier, three tiers and then the first tier gets like kind of first right refusal. Then it goes to second tier and then it goes to third tier before they see it. And 90% of the time they buy you know, a majority of it. But when I list stuff, I don't list it like I'm selling all this stuff. It's just, oh, this is all the stuff that I might get rid of. And then whatever they're interested, I sell off. And in that case, they they bought way more than I, I really thought I was even going to sell. Because like I said, it, I mean, it turns into a small store at some point. So there you go. Okay. Um, all right. We have more. 
more subjects, more questions. Let's go. Uh, we have Richie says, when, oh, when, will, okay, will you ever address the crucial impact of Synchrony Bank on the world? No, uh, Bank has had on the OCD purchase of guitars. When $20 a month allows you access to a $1,000 guitar, but for the next four years. Um, Richie, I saw this. You, you posted this a couple times, so I understand the why I'll win. Uh, so, you know, I, that's why I was chuckling because I love sometimes somebody's dedication to really get a question through to the show. <laughs> you know, you keep posting it or you keep sending the email. And like I said, it works. It's effective. Um, so, Richie, here's, there's a reason why I don't answer the question. Um, I don't, uh, look, you know, I don't have a great analogy for this. It's probably the worst analogy I'm ever going to give because it's probably incorrect. I would assume that if you worked in a slaughterhouse, maybe you don't want to eat meat anymore. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe this people who work in slaughterhouses eat steaks all day. I don't know. Um, but as you guys know, my 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 career, my life span works like this. I was in the military. Then I was in finance. Then I got into the music business. <laughs> okay. That's the three core facets of my entire history of everything I've ever done. Like it all sums up into those three categories. And... Um, all I can tell you from the army is I still barely, well, not barely. I pretty much never walk on the grass still. Don't ask why. And I don't eat bologna sandwiches because I had way too many of those. So, um, and I don't think I've had chili mac in 30 years. So, so uh, that's what I took from that. Um, in the finance world, I don't finance anything. I mean, literally nothing. I don't have anything really financed. Um, so that's why I'm not speaking about it because I don't know what to tell you about that. Um, people do finance. Uh, like I said, there's nothing, I, I, I'm, I'm, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm not, I'm not saying anything. Um, it's, it's, uh, you know, I bought a truck, uh, last year. I told you guys, I bought a brand new truck. How I did that was I, we went to one car for two years and then I went to the dealership and I just wrote a check and we left with a new truck. Um, I saved up and that's what we did. Uh, so part of that has to do with my years in finance and just the way I feel about that personally, not, not as a judgment of anyone or anything, but how it emotionally makes me feel to deal with it, to worry about it or think about it or process on it. But the other part is, is that I've also been self-employed for 20 years and the term we use is feast or famine. You know, that's how my lifestyle has worked and will continue to work for a long time. Um, you know, if you saw what I made in one month, somebody might look at that and go, wow, you are so well off. But then if you saw the next month, you'd go, wow, how do you eat? <laughs> and I'm like, obviously I eat, man. So anyways, um, but I'm just saying, I, I live in that nature. And uh, one of the things, and this is why I'm going to tell you this, and this is why, so you understand, it has no judgment against anybody. Because I live in a feast and famine environment and because I did years of basically analytics in finance, <laughs> like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm Oracle, Oracle certified. Um, uh, my lifestyle is the lifestyle that gets people in trouble when it comes to finance. And so it's kind of like that's what I'm avoiding for myself is that when I'm not making money, if I put things on credit for when I may, will make money, this can be very problematic for a person in my environment. So I don't really speak to that. So um, I I really even hate what I've just told you so far. This is just not something I want to discuss on the channel um, because again, I don't want to give anybody the impression I'm giving you advice or telling you you should, or should not do anything. But to answer your question, Richie, at least I wanted to let you know that I was, you know, it's just really it's about, I just don't have the answer. What do I think about it? I think everybody needs to make their um, adult decisions to themselves. Um, you know, it's, it's a tough world. I uh, sold a, as you guys know, I sold a bunch of stuff in February because my dog got sick and we had a bunch of hospital bills. And also summer's coming and I still haven't replaced the air conditioning units on the house. And as you know, I'm not going to finance those air conditioning units. It's going to be nuts. So, you know, in fact, I almost don't want to ever talk about it <laughs> for in history. Like after it happens, before it happens, um, we had the air conditioning people go and thank God, probably my buddy, Jamie, who, oh, his name's not Jamie, uh, uh, is probably watching this, maybe catching it as a rerun. Uh, but he saved my ass last year with my air conditioning units when they came and told me they were 30 grand for the two units, uh, 20 to 30 grand. And uh, it was 110 in the house. And my wife and I uh, were like, we don't know what we're going to do, right? <laughs> so we're sitting in my pool. This is a great story. We're sitting in my pool. It's, uh, it's 10 o'clock at night. It's 112 outside. It's 110 in the house. We're just sitting in the pool because, you know, what do you do? And uh, 
this this amazing person who's my friend uh, just comes to the side of my house, comes around the corner and he's like, got all this gear. And I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm fixing your air conditioning unit. And he took care of us. Um, and uh, I owe that to the uh, hundreds of great relationships I made owning uh, a music store for 13 years. He was a, a person who came and took lessons at my store for a decade. His son took lessons at my store for a decade. And you know, you build those great relationships. So he's, he pulled me out of that mess. And now this summer, I'm going to be dealing with paying for that mess. But back to my point is, um, so that's the way I don't, I don't know what to tell you guys about that stuff. Uh, don't, don't, I don't know, do what's best for you. <laughs> that's the, I'm sure everybody's going to have hard opinions all about it. I'm just going to tell you, um, my lifestyle doesn't really uh, let that, it's not cohesive for me. Um, what? What has Eddie got to say? Let's jump to, but thank you, Richie, for the, the subject. Uh, Eddie says, um, Eddie Shreddy. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, so Eddie Shreddy says, hey, Phil, uh, how screwed are pickups that have come in contact with steel wool? Local shop has an 80s Ibanez, but bridge pickup has felt that looks like steel bits didn't get to plug it in. Is it worth it? Um, I don't have any history of a steel wool ruining a pickup. I've not, I have no experience of that happening. Um, I know that it gets messy and you can get the little fibers of the steel wool inside the little, especially on a, a chrome uh, t style pickups, uncovered pickups, they can get in there and it's problematic. Um, I have not had any instances where I have ever experienced a pickup being defective or damaged from being exposed to steel wool in, in a casual way, which is like somebody was working on the guitar or had steel wool around the guitar. It's more just about the, you know, it's a magnet and steel wool is steel. So it just, you know, little fibers stick to everything. And then it's a pain to get it out. And um, uh, I have not seen this personally, or but I have heard of someone who told me a story, another technician tell me that somebody ruined a pickup by trying to use a magnet to get the steel wool off the pickup. And that you can do. I mean, magnets are, you know, you know, everybody understands, you know, to, shouldn't put magnets next to each other. It's not usually a good thing, especially in pickups. So, um, the, um, so in that case, like I said, I, I have no, uh, no reason to make you fear, uh, that there's a problem with a pickup just because it's been exposed to steel, steel wool. If that, if that makes any sense. I hope it makes sense. Okay, this came in on an email. I just want to give this one. This was uh, this one's great. There's two things. I got two emails that came in. And I love them, and I put them aside for this week. Uh, Robert, uh, first, Robert. This is Robert Wax. Robert Wax. I actually uh, liked your Facebook post. I don't know how it got into my feed, but it came in my personal feed. Um, pro oh, because I think you tagged me in it, and I didn't even see my name. I saw Ryan from Sixty Cycle Hum's name, and I was like, Oh, Ryan. Why is this guy tagging Ryan? And then I saw I was tagged in it. And I'm like. Oh no, what did me and Ryan do? Okay, so what did Robert tag me in? He says, hello, yesterday I took a tour of the Heritage Factory and I saw your future guitar. Uh, and he goes, it was a cool moment. It was a very cool moment for me <laughs> because, uh, so what's going on is uh, obviously Robert took a tour of the uh, Kalamazoo uh, Heritage Factory, which is also, I believe, the Harmony Factory. So they make the Harmony guitars and the Heritage guitars there. And um, and basically what happened was Robert posted that when he was in the factory, he happened to see a guitar that had my name on it. And um, and he's like, that's pretty cool. And it's like, it's like almost done. Now what's really cool for me, Robert, what you don't know is that I've been talking to Heritage, as you know, and I have this beautiful Heritage guitar here. And everybody keeps asking when that review comes out, it's soon. Okay, soon meaning in, in the month of April for sure. How early? Could be as early as next week, but it's in the month of April for sure. Um, and um, this, uh, I've told everybody the basic discussion of what happened with the Heritage. They sent the guitar. I had some critiques of it and some thoughts, and apparently Tim Pierce had those same kind of critiques and thoughts, and uh, I talked to Heritage, and uh, long story short, Heritage is apparently making another guitar for me. And I I'm going to tell you that they had mentioned that, and I I believed it to be true, but you know it's one of those things like I don't know. <laughs> so when you said, "Oh, it's here and it's like it's almost done," I was like, "Oh wow!" <laughs> I mean, I kind of assumed right because they they have been really engaged with the conversation back and forth about what we want to do. And so you guys know, if it was up to me, 
Uh, I would not review this Heritage guitar. I would review the one they're sending, the new one. They said, we would like you to review the old one, or we don't care, better yet. And I go, okay, great. So we're going to review both. And so we'll talk, well, you'll hear why I like this one and why I don't, why, why I like it a whole lot, what, what I love about it, what I don't like about it. And then the next one, you're going to hear why I uh, hopefully like that even more and what, what's up that about. So very exciting. It was very, very cool. And so uh, thank you for that, Robert. I actually, you know what? And you caught me just perfectly. I wasn't having a bad day, but I was, you know, a little uh, drained. And I saw that and I was like, what? This is great. So thank you, man. Uh, I'm, I'm really excited about this. As um, the Heritage uh, Guitars uh, interaction has been the um, probably the most anxious, anxiety feeling in, encounter with a guitar company I've ever had, even though they've been pleasant and amazing in every way, I just was afraid everything I was saying was just going to insult them and upset them considering I really respect them. And I think they make some of the best guitars on the planet earth. So there you go. All right. All righty. Okay. Um, Hold on, let's jump around. Let's see what we got here. Um, oh, that's funny. Okay. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just reading questions because I got, like I said, multiple screens. Let me do this one. This one's a great one. This one's from Lauren uh, Shipley. Lauren sent me a message saying, Hey, Phil, I ordered a fret kisser from Stu Mac on Reverb. Now, this is why this, uh, this uh, subject's interesting. Uh, it says, I didn't know they had a reverb store. It has 800 plus feedbacks. So it seems legit. Uh, the fret kisser was the same sale price as Stu Mac website plus about $6. So $6 more. Okay. It seems they charge about 6%, 6% above their website, but then everything is free shipping. So I got the fret kisser for the same price basically, and a more, and a more reasonable extra for the shipping costs, $10 less than direct. Okay, so okay, so this is what they're getting at. They're, they said they found where S Stu Mac, this is obviously we've talked about Gear Nuts, who Sweetwater does this and everybody's doing this too, um, that uh, their Sweet, uh, Stu Mac is selling a, apparently 8,000 uh, different tools or tools on uh, on Reverb. And in this particular case, the Fret Kisser was about $10 less buying it from Reverb. Um, from their website, buying from them on Reverb a way uh, to get around the ridiculous shipping costs without having to do your yearly membership. And that's a very good idea. Somebody told me that they were giving away some yearly memberships if you spent $25. So that's definitely checking out because I heard a, that is a rumor. As you guys know, we usually work out a deal with them once a year to where you guys get, I think it's half off memberships. Um, but this may be a good option to check out. The funny thing about this is, so I just wanted to share this because um, I think this is cool. Uh, and uh, I've talked about this before. Let's see if we can find it. So Stu Mac Reverb Shop. And I told you guys this on a podcast before. If you're trying to find out a store on Reverb, just type in the store's name and Reverb Shop. And what comes up is exactly, I'm share with you right now, exactly what they were saying. Stu Mac, there is a Stu Mac. Okay, got it. Got it. Um, and yeah, this is, let's, okay, they're selling a lot of the pickups, accessories. All right, let me go back to me, click here. And it's called Stumac in Athens, in Athens, Ohio. So, and where's the, uh, they said they had 8,000 good feedbacks. I'm looking for the feedbacks. And I don't see it on this for some reason. I mean, okay, here, clicked. Okay, clicked here. What does it say? It says, yeah, 8,885 feedback. So uh, most likely this is Stu Mac. Um, and like I said, do your diligence as well. But like I told you guys, that's the way I've been doing it for years, which is when you want to find a company, if they're seeing if they're selling on Reverb, go to Google, type in that company's name, Reverb Shop. That's how you find my shop, by the way. Mine's called the KYG Shop. Uh, so if you type in 
KYG or know your gear reverb shop, it'll take you to my reverb. Sometimes people go, how do you get to your reverb stuff when you're selling stuff? Um, Cause we'll sell my black stock pickups there. We'll sell um, sometimes shirts or merch. Sometimes we sell my used gear, all kinds of stuff. Um, if you want to follow it, that's how you follow it. It's the same strategy we do for anybody else. Just type in the, the business you're looking for plus reverb shop and it will go in there. Um, so so um, it could be, it looks like it looks legit. So, I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I would nothing flagging me as being odd on that. So it might be a way for the, some of you that are looking to buy a Stumac tool and not have to pay the exorbitant shipping, uh, might find a better deal. At least, at the very least, it's worth comparing. Go on the or go on Stumac's website, go to Reverb, do an AB real quick. And if it's like he said, uh, you know, if they said $10 cheaper, if it's $5 cheaper, $20 cheaper, it's worth doing. Um, I've told you guys on Amazon, you can buy Stumac on Amazon and there's free shipping. However, Stumac raises the price to the point where the shipping's almost built in. It's not much cheaper. But if you, uh, you can check Amazon, but I have not, I have, in my experience, Amazon was always the same price. There was nothing better about getting it from Amazon. Um, I don't even think it looked like it was faster through your Amazon Prime or whatever. So, but it's more more stuff to research. And sometimes a lot of you, you know, that's why we put black stock pickups on our website and on reverb. I know a lot of people feel more confident knowing that reverb, you know, you're purchasing through reverb, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, dealing direct with the business. If there's a problem, you can deal with reverb. That's coming a nice feature. I have people who buy black stock pickups, both, uh, they're cheaper on my website cause there's no sales tax, but other than that, they're the exact same price. So, uh, reverb charges sales tax. Uh, my website does not sell, start, uh, has not started sell, charging sales tax because you have to hit a certain dollar volume before you start collecting the sales tax and all that stuff, um, which is why sometimes you go to stores and they don't start sales tax. Um, it's it's uh, Luckily for me, I don't handle it. <laughs> I don't have to think about it or know about it. I'm just actually just telling you what was explained to me by the people who handle it. Um, but uh, that's a good option. This ties into something I want to share with you as, wh as well, a little fun little tidbit. Um, if I put a link in the description down below because I want to share this with you. So Stu Mac has this uh, not a Les Paul kit. This is not a Les Paul. This is not a Gibson. This is not even close. This is this is this is the farthest thing from a Les Paul uh, <laughs> guitar. They have this kit, and they're on closeout. They were uh, they're on closeout. They're down to two nineteen. I think at one point they were two ninety nine, then two twenty nine, now two nineteen. Um, so I'm just sharing this with you. If you use my affiliate link down below, uh, you can uh, you know it kicks me back a fee, which is nice. Gets uh, you know helps fund the channel. The reason I'm sharing that with you is because uh, Stu Mac made me laugh my ass off. Um, so if you didn't see Stu Mac's post about this, it was funny, if you can find it. It was basically a large company who we're not going to name ask us to stop selling these kits. <laughs> and so we're blowing them out. <laughs> so uh, so uh, what I'm telling you is this is a closeout of the uh, not Les Paul kits. And it looks like they'll probably never have Les Paul kits again, uh, as uh, obviously some large company that doesn't like them selling Les Paul looking kits has sent them a letter to tell them to stop. So <laughs> BC Rich Five Point was, was it Dean Guitars? It was probably Dean Guitars. <laughs> it was probably <laughs> uh, Yeah, I <laughs> it could it was better than right. I don't know why that made me laugh. Yeah, we should we should all pontificate of all the companies we know it's absolutely not. Did Fender ask him to stop? Probably. Probably Fender. <laughs> Harley Benton was like, please stop making kits of those guitars. So uh, Dennis says, close out $10 question mark off. It's because it was $299. So they went to $229 and now I guess uh, uh, $209 or whatever. So it, yeah, it doesn't look like a big difference, but it was from when it originally started. They dropped and I think they dropped again. Um, I have one of the kits and the kit I got, I thought was $289. So, so. Somebody says, was it Chipson? It was probably Chipson. <laughs> if you guys don't know the Chipson guys on uh, Instagram, they're amazing. So, all right. Um, so, <laughs> so I just thought I'd share that with you. I just thought it was funny, but I love that post they post. They said, they're not going to say who, but a big company asked them to stop selling those. And I'm like, huh, I, I love that. What a perfect way to get the message out there, but also not start a beef. <laughs> That's great. Uh Okay, let's see. Um, all right. 
Um, we need to jump into these. And it's a good time for me to drink water. Let's see what we got here. We have from Raphael who says, hey, I've done three uh, DIY kits from Cobain guitars. I guess that's C-O-B-A-N, Cobain guitars. Um, and I've learned loads about assembling, finishing, and fretwork. What do you think are the limits of do-it-yourself kits? There is really no limits. You know, when I did the great guitar build-off uh, with the Crimson Guitar Kit, you know, I went straight boring. Like I was like, they sent me a Paul Reed Smith kit. And we just kept it like, let's just make a, look, my goal, my thought was, can we make a, P, a kit as good as a PRS? Like, that's what I I, I felt, that's all I cared about. Um, my logic was, you know, hey, this is a kit of a Paul Reed Smith guitar. Paul Reed Smith guitars are some of the best made guitars on the planet Earth. Let's let's see if we can do it, you know? And so I put stainless steel frets on it and I, Paint Huffer, Brian at Paint Huffer, you know, had it, paint, you know, painted it for me, which was fantastic. And I did, you know, um, amazing setup and workmanship on it. And we put in some, I hand wound some, some special uh, black sock pickups that I've never made since in that guitar um, that I thought were gonna be really cool for the guitar. And I actually did a bunch of, in fact, it's so funny. I, I never know what to do about this, but in that video, I think I explained that I made five or six different pickups because I was trying to find the right ones, and that's and then I end up going with the two. I still have the other ones, and every time I go in my shop, they're just sitting there. I go, what should I do with these pickups? Yeah, I don't want to sell them. Maybe we'll give them away or charity something. I just you know they were the they were the pickups that I they're made the, almost identical like those pickups. They're just I just like something about those when I was testing because I test the pickups. So anyways. Um, that's the way I was going with it. But if you paid attention to that and the ones subsequently after that, you can see people can take a kit guitar and turn it into a work of art. I mean, you know, you know, I mean, so I don't think there's a limit to a DIY, a DIY kit guitar. I think you can do a lot. And um, I mean, I think you can take a, I think with the right time, effort, and expertise. I think you can take a three hundred dollar, two hundred dollar DIY kit and make a guitar that rivals a three thousand dollar guitar. I look. I'm not. I. I. I'm glad it was for charity. Okay. I'm glad it was for charity. But, you know, the person who bought my DIY guitar, they spent four thousand, five thousand dollars on that guitar. Right. Some crazy number like that. Um, I mean, it went to charity. But still, that's a lot of money on that guitar. And my DIY Telecaster beer caster kit went for a couple thousand dollars. Same thing. And as much as I, I love supporting charity, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't think they got some kind of money value out of that. And those guitars I thought were flawlessly perfect. That's all, you know, so you can do a great job. And and like I said, in my logic, all I did is I took the kits and I made an equivalent of what those kits are supposed to be of. But I think if you did some really interesting things with it, change the headstocks, change the body shape, you know, do stuff, I think you can make something really, really exciting. But, um, you know, my expertise is not in design so much as it is in, you know, obviously just hours and hours, hundreds and thousands of hours of working on guitars. You know, I just kind of know where, where I want, what I want the guitar to feel like when I'm done. So I think you can do anything you want. And I don't think there's a limit. Uh, Grumpy Mike Guitar says, any chance we'll be seeing a KYG work shirts in the merch store anytime soon? Seriously, take my money. Uh, yes and no, Grumpy Mike Guitar. Thank you for asking for that. Uh, yes, there'll be um, work shirts, uh, not in the merch store. So uh, what I'm wearing today <laughs> is uh, uh, the, the lovely Shauna, Mrs. McKnight, uh, made this for me, right? So this shirt, you can see what she did is she had, I'm um, away from the mic. So this is a work shirt and she had patches made, these custom patches made, and she made this shirt. And so there'll be some version of a work shirt uh, before. Some of you guys know that did, we did a very limited run of work shirts for the patrons. Uh, I, you know, it was during COVID, but it was definitely a year or two ago. And uh, you guys know that they were expensive, but more importantly, we made zero dollars on them. This is why we sold them to patrons only. So you guys know it wasn't like or any other thing than it just didn't make sense logistically to sell a shirt that we literally couldn't make a single penny on because we didn't feel uh, like we should charge any more than what we were charging. And we were paying a fortune to have these ones stitched up and done. And it was just, it was just, I was being difficult about what I wanted in the shirt. And so, um, so Shauna has been working since then uh, 
to make a more affordable work shirt. And, um, and uh, she found, uh, she came up with this idea. She's like, what if I have them make patches, you know, the New York patch, and, you know, she assembles the shirts. And then she can buy the shirts in bulk and uh, get the price down and then do the patches. And it's way, way cheaper than having a shirt embroidered. And to me, it looks fantastic. I mean, you guys probably didn't even notice. I mean, you can tell, but it, I mean, I, I like it just as much. So uh, soon, soon on these, I'm sure, or something like that. I don't know. Um, all right. But thank you for asking because, you know, we're always trying to make something fun and do something cool. Uh, Randy says, Hey, I just watched. No, he didn't watch anything. He just traded an Epiphone Gibson inspired fifties Les Paul for a Gibson studio with case after trade. I got it for 550 bucks. I feel it was a good deal. Thoughts. You know, I mean, here's the deal. I, I always, I've said this moments before in the podcast, uh, you know, I think the, you know, we all should just get a Gibson studio and that's good enough for all of us. It's like, I don't know why the binding and stupid, silly things matter sometimes, especially the studios that have the maple tops. Um, if that's, you know, so inclined that what you care about, uh, you know, there's always this part of me is going to tell you like, Oh, there's nothing wrong with Epiphone, but I mean, come on, good move, man. Right. I mean, Epiphone for a, a Gibson studio. Yeah. I think so. I, let me put it this way. I I like the uh, the the Epiphone uh, 50s, you know, Gibson inspired 50s guitars. I like them. But if you said, hey, Phil, which one of those two would you pick? I'd pick the Gibson Studio Les Paul. So, I mean, it's just it's just how it's going to be. There's just as much as I love Squire, as much as I love Epiphone, as much as I love all that stuff. I mean, I'm never going to pick that stuff over a USA made iconic guitar. In most cases, right? A uh, fair fight. In other words, what I'm saying is, is if you gave me less Paul Gibson and it didn't play great and an Epiphone play great, I'd take the guitar that always plays better. But, you know, there's something cool about that. Uh, but your mentality might be different. Some people will tell you the opposite of what I said is to give you a devil's advocate on that. Somebody will say like, oh, the studio is a stripped down guitar where the 50s was all decked out. And if that's what matters to you, that's what matters to you. To me, I'm not really interested in the ornate look of it or things like that so much as just you know the way the guitar feels and i like the feel of the gibson les paul a lot so um hold on why did i miss okay i was gonna say alex says tuner says the open string is in tune but the first couple frets are sharp flat <laughs> poorly cut nut Cowboy chords on my Gibson Les Paul special sounds terrible. It sounds like your intonation's out. I mean, that would be my first thing. So first you want to check your intonation. And in your intonation, obviously, not only do you have to adjust your bridge, but you also have to exactly make sure your nut is cut uh, correctly. That is a, a very important uh, part to the equation. So that's what I would say. Yes, your nut could be the issue, but your intonation sounds out as well. More so the intonation than the nut, because, I mean, once you start fretting, the guitar, it's not going to, the nut's going to kind of have a whole ton. Cause again, you're, you know, from the bridge to your fretted note, that's, that's the sound you're getting from your fretted note to your nut that gets, you're, you're stopping the string from getting to the nut. So the nut's usually not the culprit for that particular problem. It can have an effect though, if it's not cut correctly, but I'm still telling you intonation is your, is your focus where you have to go with this. Uh, clown, uh, clan, clan of uh, clown, clan of house cats says replacing a dead Piazzo saddle, Piazzo, Piazzo saddle <laughs> for the first time on a JP six have to replace the output module too, because there's a new design after 2013. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's a crappy job. Um, it's not hard. I used to have to replace so many in the Parker guitars. It was just never fun. It's fine. You know, it's the modules more the pain in the butt, just making sure, you know, um, the only, I don't want to jinx it for you. <laughs> the only thing I used to hate about that is, uh, troubleshooting it is when, you know, cause once they're in the module, once the problem's in the module, it's almost impossible to figure out what's going on inside there. You know, you can do a ton of tests, but it just, it doesn't do anything. Okay. It is, we're one hour in. So guess what we're going to do? We're going to do the guitar of the week. That's right. So we're going to do the guitar of the week. I thought it'd be fun as you guys, I uh, hope you guys like this segment. And uh, so let's go ahead and do that. 
So let me grab the guitar. I'll play you my little pre-recorded message while I pick the guitar, and uh, and uh, we'll do it. All right, guys, I'm picking out the guitar for the Guitar of the Week. While you're waiting, please hit the like and subscribe button to help this channel. I appreciate that in helping the podcast grow. And uh, what guitar am I picking? Well, let's see. Here it is. All right. It is this beautiful D'Angelico <laughs> a guitar right here. Let me go here real quick. And what do we have? This is a guitar that I got right before the end of the last year. This is the uh, Premier Mini DC. So this is a smaller body. It's like a size of an ES-335. So it's a smaller uh, body. This is the Brown Burst, which probably is not coming out super great in the video, but it's very dark, as you can see. Okay. Now, this has a couple things that are going on that's really cool. This guitar now sells for $8.99. I think during the holiday season, if you got on top of it, I think these were down to $6.99, something like that, $7.99. They were a little better deal. Um, so what do we have? We have a uh, maple neck. This is a set neck, of course. This is a, 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 a center. Yeah. Yep. So solid in the center and then hollow on both sides. Um, I love these little ebony knobs that they do. It's a really nice little detail right there. We have a maple neck, if I didn't say that, 14-inch radius with a C-shape, but I do not get C-shape from this at all. Um, this feels very D or U-shaped, very thin, very, very uh, Gibson 60s neck, uh, in my opinion. If you played some of the thinner Gibson uh, 60s neck, that's uh, what I, I feel when I check this out. Beautiful block mother of pearl inlays and uh very it's a, got a graph tech new bone xl nut 22 medium vintage nickel silver frets medium vintage um I, I hate the word vintage in this description because vintage always sounds tiny you know little frets these are not tiny frets these would definitely be uh they kind of vibe like the narrow tall frets on the fender american series guitars so really cool you have grover imperial tuners you can see right here and since we're looking at the back uh, back of the headstock you can also see it's made in indonesia and that's one of the things that made it uh, appeal to me because uh, as you guys know acoustic guitars in this price point and hollow body guitars generally are going to be made in china for the expense it's very rare to have them made in indonesia or korea anymore so uh really cool and i still believe that i think uh in my personal opinion uh, indonesia is just banging with quality right now they're putting out some of the best guitars in the market for the prices now, of course, it has this over-the-top ornate headstock, as you can see, and there's definitely mixed opinions about that. <laughs> um, I like it because I don't have anything like that. You know, this big ornate uh, chrome truss rod cover and then this, like, I don't know what you call this thing, like ornament? I guess we'll call it ornament on the on the tip of the headstock. Just looks really fantastic. This one came up set, set up really well, and it also included a deluxe gig bag, which I thought was a nice little added thing. I want to go one more. Um, they're saying, oh, two volumes, two tones, three-way toggle switch. And, tw oh, that's another thing. I'm just trying to point out the stuff. Here's two things I want to share with you real quick. 25-inch radius, so like a, a Paul Reed Smith. But this is the part that I don't know and I don't quite understand. Um, they're saying pao ferro, pao ferro, pao ferro neck. Our, 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 sorry, Powell Farrell um, fretboard. Man, I just don't see that. It looks like really dark rosewood. I mean, it almost looks like ebony, but it's, I mean, but so um, I trust them, but man, looking at it, I mean, you guys see it, right? This is a really dark fretboard. This doesn't, so it doesn't really, it doesn't really look like, uh, usually the Powell Farrell ferro whatever is really light so there you go okay so what are we going to do we're going to plug it into my fender deluxe 65 reverb uh head yeah kev says no way it's pay 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 ferro I, I agree uh yeah it's just really dark so it could be one of the things though is that um you know when i bought it it's one of those things like they could have changed the spec for this year and then i'm reading current specs Okay, so it's, um, <laughs> Wendell says, I strongly dislike the headstock. Wendell, I had a trouble with these headstocks for the longest time. They were just too, like, over the top, like, just too much for me. But for this guitar, I don't know why. I just, like, this is just vibe the way I wanted it to. Um, and it sounds great. So let me go ahead. Let me switch 
to the guitar view right here. Okay, I gotta move my chair, that would help. One of the things I gotta do to adjust here. Okay, so like I said, I'm running through the 65 Deluxe Reverb. Let's go ahead and check out the neck if we could. Here we go. And this would help if I unmuted it. <laughs> Here we go. This is really the neck this time, for real. Okay, now I want to do is show you the middle position. These are the two pickups, and there's a really nice, like, in-between tone, tone that's really bright, and I like it. So, I mean, a guitar like this just has that vibe, which is what I was going for, right? And, um, and you know, I have an ES-35 Gibson, and I was thinking about getting an ES-39. I had one a long time ago, and I got rid of it. And I was lucky enough at Sweetwater, when I picked one of these up, I played the neck, and I played the guitar, and I go, man, this is it. This is so much cheaper. And it's everything I, I kind of want it to be. So I go, this is the way I'm going to go for this. So let me go ahead, go back to the guitar view. And let's do the bridge, which is going to be really bright because, you know, it's the bridge pickup. Now, a great comment is from, who said that? I, mean, I just saw the comment. Uh, I forgot who said it. Oh, uh, yeah, HK says, hey, that switch location is odd. It is odd. Um, I, you know, kind of one up here, but on the Gibson, it's there too. So, I, I believe. Uh, so, yeah, I, I agree. I wish it was up top. I kind of used to the Les Paul. Let's go ahead and switch and do some overdrive. So, I'm just going to use my... My OD11 overdrive that I like so much. I'm gonna start with a neck pickup and give you some some neck distortion sounds. So, so basically, as you can see, it's like a brown burst, beautiful guitar. Uh, out of the box, uh, no fret issues, no nothing I had to correct. In fact, they still have the original strings on here. I don't know what the strings are. I thought, I thought it said strings. Oh, D Angelico, ten to forty sixes. Okay, that makes sense because whatever's on here, you know, the the ball, the the balls are weird because they're like. Black, gold, silver, black, gold, silver, which is not a color pattern I'm familiar with. That makes sense that they're, they're having their own strings made. Um, so didn't have to change the strings. That's um, that's actually a good thing to mention because sometimes when I get guitars, you know, I don't know about you guys, but when I get a guitar out of the box, I play it and the strings are just, they got to go immediately. So, um, so that is 
the Premiere DC Mini by D'Angelico. So any questions about it? Anyone got anything to say, good or bad? <laughs> uh, so for what do you think? $900 in today's market. What do you think? $900 made in Indonesia with a deluxe gig bag. Um, they're using the only brand name components. Well, I think the bridge might be. Let's see what the bridge is. The bridge is. Okay, so the tops of spruce veneer, laminated ma maple body, semi hollow. No mention that I can see hardware. Okay, bridge and tailpiece. Oh, nickel tune matic So, okay, so they're using the Grover 109 Super Automatics. So that's cool. And then they're using the Tunematic uh, bridge system, and then they're using their own pickups. These are the Supro bolt buckers. As you guys know, uh, D'Angelico bought Supro and Pigtronics, and of course, that was probably a smart move to start branding their electronic side, the pickup side, to something Supro, since that's what, you know, they're known for electronics on the Supro side. Um, uh, Susan wants to know, how's the bridge? I think the bridge is great. No. No scratchingness, no, 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 no wackiness. The, usually on these bridges, that corner can get really sharp, and it's fine. Like I said, I've done nothing to it. Um, I got it. I pulled it out of the box. I played it, and I've been playing it since. Um, you know, I tend to, because I like it, I tend to bring it out for the show and have it in the background. But for the most part, it spends most of its time uh, on a stand in, right outside this office where I can pick it up and play it. Um, I have a two-story house. This office is on the top story. And then outside my office is a little hallway area and I can look down into uh, where my wife works. And sometimes when she's talking to me, I like to sit there <laughs> right outside my office. And so I have this guitar usually set right there because acoustically it's loud. Right, just resonates, right? It's really nice. It's gonna sound like a wah, because I'm gonna put my arm in front of it. I'm trying to be funny with the wah, but it's not gonna work. But it... So, uh, Brad Guitar, may, 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 I don't know. Brad Guitar says Ebony Neck. I, I think Ebony Neck, but they're saying Peo Ferro. So, there you go. And of course, a lot of beautiful binding. So there's your Guitar of the Week. I hope you guys like that. Let me go ahead and put it back real quick. This, I feel bad that I don't remember the viewer's name that started this. They asked me why I don't play guitar more. And I said, well, it's because I don't like podcasts where they play guitar. And, you know, that's what's great about your guys' ideas, about people's ideas, about the way people think and the way we communicate. You know, this is something I was not interested in doing at all, you know, playing the guitar on the show at all. And then I thought, well, you know, what if we do a guitar of the week? And, you know, most of them will be my personal guitars, but it'll be something fun right? Just something fun. And that's what this is now. Just a little fun. And, and what's nice is because we do the pod clips on the second channel, we cut this out, you know. And then what's great now is if someone ever asks me on a show and they go, hey, have you, you know, what's that strat there? And I go, oh, if I don't have a, a, an in-depth review, I go, I, I don't have no way to tell them. But now I can go, oh, it's it's got a Guitar of the Week, you know, video you can watch. So, I don't know. Like I said, I also put a link to the guitar in case any of you get inspired to buy one. They give me a kickback. But as I point out, I would be remiss if I didn't say, look, if you click the affiliate link <laughs> to buy this D'Angelico, uh, they're going to give me very little. OK, uh, if you call them, they might give you 10 percent off. So I'd rather you have more money in your pocket, especially since it's not going to give me a lot in my pocket, like I said. Um, but if you're so the type of personality is like, you're not going to call them. You're just going to buy it because you're, you're freaking out and got to have it. Uh, I'll take the kickback. So, okay. <laughs> Steve says that headstock is so much better than no headstock. <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't know why that makes me laugh, but I love it. Um, and then, uh, and then, like I said, also keep in mind, uh, look out there on the internet. And there's deals on these things. You know, D'Angelico likes to run a lot of deals. So, okay. Um, we're going to move on. It's time to move on. Why? I don't know. It's time. Um, 
And by the way, we did get a viewer send us a song for Guitar of the Week. I just haven't had a chance to implement it, record it, put it in the thing. I mean, again, everything, uh, we move at a certain speed. So, you know, people send us stuff and don't realize sometimes it's going to take months before something comes of it. Uh, Miserable Turd said, have you, e- have you ever done a McKnight deep dive on the Texas Toast guitar? Dylan Tone suggested it on his podcast last night. So I did, there was a, you know, there's a, there's always a logic to what I do. Um, you know, um, I, I wish I was uh, being exaggerating. I'm not. Everything I do has a, a purpose and a, and a logic to it. Um, there's a very exciting video coming this Tuesday. <laughs> okay. Um, that has, so, you know, has nothing to do with Texas Toast. So let's start there. Um, there is a, I don't, I don't remember the title of the video because we already have it titled, but the title is something to the effect of it's like the, my dream guitar ever in life is come true. Okay. And, uh, that t- you know, clickbait, right? Um, but it's true. Um, there, there's a guitar coming out on Tuesday on the channel that I wanted, I have wanted now for 15 years from a major brand. And there's even a funny backstory on that, which you'll hear in the video where I told the the owner of that company 15 years ago, this is the guitar I wanted. And they made it, essentially. Um, and they're releasing some exciting stuff. And I'm so under a gag order. Uh, I'm sure you're going to get a ton of YouTubers pumping out videos on Tuesday. I am actually pumping out two videos on Tuesday of this because I was so uh, vehement about getting these products and, and being able to discuss this on the channel. Um, now, the... Uh, the reason I'm telling you that is because um, the when I do the deep dives, there's so much time put into them in the backstory, the back the back end of it. With the Texas Toast guitar, I was looking on the calendar, going, "This guitar is not going to get released anytime soon as a deep dive," and I really wanted them to be ahead of this video. If that makes any sense, there's a reason why I want certain guitars. There's a reason why um, there's a reason why my last deep dive video was a $99 guitar that stands still frets. And the previous one to that is a $6,000 guitar. Cause I like to variate what you guys see. I, I, I find it more interesting for me, but also I find it more interesting for you. You know, who wants to see the same thing over and over again. So I did that. So that's another thing that's cool. So I actually strategically wanted the, uh, the uh, Texas toast guitar in the deep are in the uh, guitar of the week. So it could got, got out faster. Cause otherwise I was looking at the calendar going, you know, uh, as you know, I have a, someone helps me with the calendar and we were looking at the calendar and we're like, we're, we were thinking like, September, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, this isn't going to work. Um, now something else though, as you guys might notice, there's another Texas toast guitar behind me and, um, we're working with them on that too. So there, there will be a deep dive video of the Texas toast guitar errs, I guess is the best way to put it. But as, uh, as I've said it before on the show, and I just got reminded by another YouTuber, they said that they remember me saying on this in the show and they said, it's so, um, so, uh, so true which was um, anytime you add another guitar, anytime you add more products to a video, you're doubling the time of the video. That's true. So two guitars, it takes twice as long to do as than a one guitar video. Um, Another YouTube uh, says Texas Toast guitars are overpriced, less Paul's. So interesting, interesting. Obviously, I just saw your comments. I wanted to react to it. Um, I I have no, uh, you know, when it comes to Gibson and Texas Toast, I don't have any preference to give to either one of them, right? Um, so this this is the reason why I'm telling you this. I, like I said, everyone's biased. So what is the bias? I'm a little biased. I have no preference over those two brands other than obviously small builders. You know, I root for the underdog more than the, the big con- corporate conglomerate. Um, look, in... I've said it before. If you want a Gibson for your resale value, it's this one of the smart, smartest guitar purchases you can make. Um, I can prove it over and over again. People prove it all over again. Um, you know, Gibson guitars are desirable. They have been desirable and they'll probably continue to be desirable if that's what you care about, your resale value, okay? Um, I told you guys this as I was very clear that I have, gosh, in the last five years, I probably owned 50 Gibsons. Cause like I said, anytime I had any stuff to offload, I would trade it for a Gibson cause I knew I could get you know, m- good money for it later. They're just going to go up in price. I even mentioned that two of those Gibsons that I cur- that I bought uh, or I call rescued them because I got them so cheap. It was ridiculous. My buddy, my best friend Ralph owns both of those because 
he didn't know I had them. We were talking in, a, in, a, in the kitchen one day, and he's like, I'd really like to have a Gibson V. And I'm like, I have one in the closet. He's like, what? And then one day he's like, I'd really like it a gold top. I said, I have one in the closet. And he goes, no, not your, you know, I don't want your gold top. I go, no, no, my gold top's in the office. I have another, I just bought a gold top at a guitar center because it was a smoking deal. Um, because like I said, I know that I'll get my money back or if not more. And again, anytime I can trade. So if you, so to compare a small builder, when you say overpriced, if a small builder and a Gibson ch- charge the same price, you could easily argue that the better value to dollar return comes from the Gibson because the small builder is unknown. It has a very small uh, small purchasing demographic. It's not going to have a lot of people to buy from it. But the term overpriced, well, first of all, that's an internal thing. So usually overpriced gets thrown around a lot. And I'm not accusing you of this. I'm just being clear because this is a very honest thing to say. Overpriced is sometimes thrown out when you're broke. And I don't want to say broke. I want to say like you can't afford it. Like if I was to say a Lamborghini is overpriced, to be honest with you, that's the dumbest thing I could say because I can't afford a Lamborghini even if even if it wasn't overpriced. <laughs> what, if, what if a Lamborghini was really beautifully perfectly priced right now? It doesn't matter. I'm not paying 225000 or whatever it is for a car. Um, so sometimes people say overpriced, and I understand that because they don't have the money to say that. And I'm not saying you said that. Sometimes they say that overpriced because, again, it's out of their comfort zone. They're like, I would never spend that. I've said this before. There are a ton of guitars I will never buy because they're out of my comfort zone of, of what I pay. But I want to say this just because it's a small builder. And so, you know, if you would have said Gibson's overpriced, I wouldn't defend Gibson. Like I said, I don't, I just want you to know what my bias are. The reason I wouldn't define, defend Gibson is because they don't need defense. They're a big corporation making hundreds of millions of dollars and they're fine. Small builders, though, I think the thing that you really have to digest is when you say the term overpriced, really think about the value to dollar proposition in, in, in terms of what they're getting from it. Okay. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's hard for me <laughs> to say a, a guitar company is overpricing their guitars and the guys are driving, you know, like one's driving a pickup truck. I don't know this for sure, but I'm just saying one's driving a pickup truck and the other one's driving a Honda and they live in a, you know, nice home, a decent house, and they support some kids. I'm like, I don't think they're the guys screwing you is what I'm trying to say. You know, it's, it's sometimes these terms get thrown around in the weirdest ways. So, um, Texas Toast Guitars, actually, I think are super inexpensive uh, for what they are. That's just how I, what I believe. Um, as, as someone who's been, you know, around all this stuff for so many years and fixed so much of the stuff and been to these shops and been to these factories, they don't come to my mind as overpriced. I, I think, I don't think they're, I don't think they're dirt cheap by any means, but I mean, you know, I think they, uh, I think they're actually close to right priced and i could be wrong i thought for sure somebody correct me i thought the one behind me this silver one i think it's like fifteen hundred dollars right that seems like a pretty reasonable price for a guitar i'll tell you what i like about the two texas toast guitars that were sent to me by the way um they are the same guitar which is what i'll say in the video but one has more uh, ornate like the other one has a, a beautiful wood top and the other one has a fancier neck with the walnut and maple walnut maple and uh, it has a, a veneer over the headstock and it looks, and I love, and I absolutely, so, you know, I absolutely love that as a person. And I, I, I want to share this with you just so you guys know. Um, I absolutely love any business model wrapped around the concept of everyone gets the same quality, but people who spend more get nicer looking things. I love that idea. You know, um, I, I, um, I personally was a victim of, of car, a car manufacturer because of the concept of they didn't have that in their business model. So, you know, the first time I heard a car company like, uh, you know, I'm going to use Honda as an example, where it's like the base model car came with the same fe- safety features as the most expensive car. In my particular instance, what happened with me, I'm not going to go into detail, but just so you know, what happened with me was I was in a very expensive car and an accident happened, which was not my fault. And um, we were hurt really badly. And we would have been fine if we would have just bought the next model above, okay? Because it had the safety feature that would have prevented some serious, you know, serious problems. The reason we didn't buy the model above, not because we didn't have the money, because we didn't want the leather seats and the stupid stereo system. 
And that car company decided to package that safety feature into these comfort pr products. And we didn't know that. So I say that not to get preachy, but to point out that I really love people who come to you and say, hey, look, if you get this car, you get all the safety features as the expensive model. And if you just want a nicer stereo and leather seats, you just buy that separate. And I love a company who is like, we make the best quality guitar for the base price. And if you like fancy wood tops, or if you like, you know, fancier, you know, pickup options, or if you like, you know, different like aesthetics in the fretboard, you know, pay for that. I'm a big fan of that attitude. Uh, so, you know, and that's why I, I, and I'm only telling you the, the, um, the, my issue with the, the car industry, so to speak, is that was a horrible horrible event in my life and it forever changed me because like i said it changed me as a consumer to realize what it means when somebody says we don't make a lower version of a thing we just make a good thing and then we make you know aesthetically pleasing more attributes so i when i see the texas toast things i kind of see that in their business model and i could be wrong but that's what i see um and that's why i kind of uh, plus it's always there's always a part of me that's always going to want to defend the small guys a little bit like I said, that's why I said, thank you for the comment. I'm not upset about your comment by any means. Um, these are the discussions I love to have. I think they're the hardest ones to have because, um, you know, you you could be right when you say they're overpriced, just as easy as I could be wrong. But I wanted to give you my reasoning and 20 years experience and where I see what I see, if that helps. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, BJ says guitars can be overpriced. Absolutely, everything can be overpriced. But the terminology gets a little tricky, right? Um, sometimes sometimes the pricing can put it out of the market, and that's more accurate too. Uh, Mitchell says he has a Texas Toast Challenger, and they build a great guitar. Yeah, I mean, look, if you, you know what's great about them is, again, uh, you know, I've done thousands of these guitar reviews, and... Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to say this, uh, it's hard to get factories to let me see everything. It's hard to get me, them to share things with you guys. You know, I always tell everybody, if you want to know how good the restaurant is, go in the kitchen. You know, some manufacturers, especially overseas, they won't even let me come, even though I'm out for the bill. And again, I don't want to I don't want to have this kind of a discussion, really. But you guys know the diehards that are watching right now, you know, the brands, even recently a brand who reached out and they were like, I told them I will only review their guitars if they let me come to the factory on my dime. I will pay. I will pay for the hotel, the fuel, the expenses. It's about two, three thousand dollars to go do this. I will do it all. And I will I will not put out any video that they don't approve. And they still don't want me to come right they don't want me to see it or show you and you know i really don't interested to go if i can't show you but at least if i could see it i can feel a certain way when we talk about it on fridays like i can say like with conviction going no no they they do do what they say they they do they are building them in the u.s even though it doesn't look like they are you know and it looks like it's all fake and um and same thing with overseas, you know, some of those factories, I've just keep saying like, I'll pay, it's expensive. I'll fly there. I'll go, you know, Hey, I want to see. And even I, and I know deep down, it's, a, it's a, not even the great idea because they could just make the factory look a certain way when you get there. But here's what I'm trying to say. Guys like Texas toast, not only they're going to show you their shop, you can see their shop in videos. You can go there and learn how to build their guitars. In fact, here's the deal. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll say. The, to the comment about them overpriced. That's a great, I never thought about this. I wonder, you know, if you took the Texas, uh, another YouTube, again, not calling you out. Like I said, good good comment, good good conversation, okay? Like I said, we can still have a beer and be friends or a Coke, whichever works. But I wonder if, I wonder what the perception, perception of their guitars are from the people who have went to their shop and learned to build a guitar versus the people who didn't. I wonder if that changes. And not to say one would be right. So if you built the guitar and you said, you know, it's just, I'm really curious. I'm really curious. And actually I'm, I'm, I'm not even curious if they built a guitar in their shop and, and, and Matt and Chris taught them how to build a guitar. And they said, Oh no, these guitars are not overpriced. I'm not really curious about that. I'm curious about the person who did it and still thinks they're overpriced. I'm curious if there's that person that exists like that did it and still thinks that I'm really, really be interesting. But like I said, you can do that. They'll teach you how to build a guitar at Texas toast. And then you can, uh, and then you can try to sell it and see what you get for it. It would be interesting. Like I said, it's an interesting thing. Uh, but 
Uh, Tony says, Phil, will you go and build your own guitar at Texas Toast? You know, I have talked to them about coming out so many times. My problem is my schedule's wacky. Trust me, I want to go to their shop just because I want to go to the shop. Like I said, they would be number 37 of shops and factories I've been to. So trust me, I'm all, I'm all for it. Um, I'll, I'll tell you what the problem is. <laughs> Uh, uh, and then you guys can make fun of me all you want. Uh, even though they're called Texas Toast, they are in Colorado. So let me explain it to you from an Arizonan kind of mentality. There is a big chunk of the year pretty much coming. Oh, no, we're going to summer, so we're okay. So maybe this summer, okay? Let's just say there's there's like three, four months of the year I'm not even going to think about going to Colorado. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> there's, uh, I only own a hoodie. I don't even own a jacket. <laughs> So I don't, you know, when it gets like 53 in Arizona, you're freezing. You turn on the heater, you put on your hoodie and you stay in the house. Um, so yeah, but maybe for the summer and stuff, I just have to line up their class and stuff. It'd be cool. It'd be cool. I would love to do it. I don't really want to build a guitar there. I'd really doc. I'd rather document the stuff and share with you. If that makes any sense. Uh, so, but I love, I love the, um, I love the conversation. So, and like I said, check them out, check out their guitars. Um, and then we'll, you know, like I said, there'll be more videos coming soon. And then, like I said, if you don't like Texas Toast, that's fine. Check out all the small builders. Check out every builder. That's why I highlight anybody. I'll highlight, I'll highlight, I highlight the mass produced Chinese inexpensive guitars. I highlight the Italian hand builder. I had, you know, the Colorado builders, Fender. Get, I, to me, it's a guitar channel. And I think um, I'm not here to choose for you and decide for you. Uh, I'm here to show you as much as I can show you. And then you figure out what's smart and what works for you. So, okay. Um, <laughs> I don't know how you guys started talking about bong water. What's so weird. Okay. Let me get back to work. I feel like this is, if I get engaged too much in the co the chat, then it becomes a this, I'm off. I'm off course. Okay, let's button this show up. Uh, we have Michael Nielsen. What's up, buddy? He says I actually, I actually always appreciate your insight on the business and life. Thank you, man. I, I've you got, obviously uh, Michael Nielsen's channel is amazing. Um, you know, if you don't know Michael, he, what I love about his channel, and I always say this, is that not only can he play like a monster, and he always gets the best tone out of everything, which drives me nuts. Um, but you know, his experience in the industry and recording and stuff is just fantastic. Um, so if you haven't checked out his channel, I'll put a link right here. Cause like anytime I can timestamp that. And I, I, I saw Ryan from six cycle hum too. So we'll timestamp his channel as well. So you can check out six cycle hum. As you know, he's a big, uh, friend of the channel and we're a friend of his channel. And, um, so thank you for the compliment. I appreciate that. Uh, Luis Martinez says any recommendations for a combo amp DIY kit? Um, I had great success and fun with the Mojo tone kits. Um, uh, if you go to Stu Mac, the Stu Mac kits are Mojo Tone kits, but Stu Mac uh, specifies what they want in them. So if you do the Stu Mac kit, there'll be a few components that are different. In my in my observation of those two kits, they upgrade a few things for Stu Mac. Stu Mac requests a few things to be improved, like a better capacitor, better things like things that you could do your own. Uh, but I really, really enjoyed the Mojo and Tone kit. And, you know, I highly recommend getting the base, ki the kit, the cheapest one they got. Uh, it's like their five watt, two, you know, it's a volume and tone knob type Fender style amp. Go with the base, base model. Um, I did the class and it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. And, um, but really what I learned was if I didn't have the class, I would definitely feel a lot more comfortable with the base model unit. So go with the cheapest one. Um, if your logic is like, yeah, I may not like that one. I may not use it. So I want the nicer one. Trust me. You know, once you build the smaller one, you'll either want to build the next amp or you won't. So, um, building amps, I got it out of my system. You know, <laughs> it's, I did a couple, uh, well two, that's a couple. And, um, what did I learn from that? Uh, it, it was fun to learn it like, you know, but I would liken it for some reason to me, building an amp to me was probably, it's how I felt when I would work on heavy equipment or if I worked on an air conditioning unit, to me, it was just technically I'm just soldering and doing stuff. Um, I don't know why a guitar just feels like a different environment to me. It just feels more, you know, I just love that. Plus I like not having uh, anything that can kill me if I touch it wrong. That's a, that's a nice feeling. <laughs> There's nothing that's going to kill you in the guitar. So. <laughs> that. Michael says, is the champ? I believe it's the champ model. I think they have two. So. 
But yes, I believe it's a Fender Champ clone. Uh, Smart Mammal says, Phil, did you... Phil, did you do a review of the Katana Go? No, I'm not on Boss's uh, list, so they don't send me stuff. You know, I don't, I don't make a whole lot of the, uh, the, uh, you know, the companies that send out thing to everybody lists. I'm usually off like 90% of those lists, which is fine. It, it works out great for me because um, Boss, I've never worked with, so I don't know. But I, when I was getting on those lists, I was getting some weird stuff. Like companies were like. Yeah, we want you to do a video, but we want you to do it. And they would set a date like a week or two weeks after everybody else did their videos. Because <laughs> they just... And then uh, a company, an amp company told me this. They said, you know, we just don't know what you're going to say. We really like you to be last. And I don't know what that means. I don't think I ever say anything bad. I Sometimes I don't understand. I think it's in the reviews. I think... I don't think they're actually upset about anything. I think in the reviews. I think we're upset about these conversations we have here on the show. And it's funny thing about this, this show, this is you guys. You guys ask these questions and these comments, and I'm just, we're just talking about them. So, but yeah, uh, no, I didn't get to check it out and they didn't send it. Um, just like all the new Line 6 products, they don't, Line 6 didn't send any products out. Um, this stuff though, if you mention it, you know, and I see the opportunity to get it and put it on the channel, I'll do it for sure. But, you know, there's not, it's not a hard, it's not, I don't have a whole lot to complain about because we're already backed up with what I got to do now. So, you know, just I sometimes I'd rather have a day or two off a week and do more stuff. Um, okay. Uh, Eric, uh, and we'll, I'll button up. I just want to grab a couple fat, rapid fire questions and we'll button up. Eric says, Hey, what guitar hangers do you use that are safe for nitro scent finish? I use string swing. That's the only stuff I use. Um, period. Uh, and it's, uh, I've never, uh, had a nitro lacquer burn ever. I've never had an issue with any guitar ever. Um, hundred percent with string swing. And I've, um, you know, been used, I've been using them that exclusively forever and ever and ever and ever. So highly recommend them. Funny thing about string swing is, is that uh, string swing, the company, when I asked them if they're safe for nitro lacquer, uh, nitro lacquer uh, cellulose finish, uh, they said, because they said kindly and nicely, because they're a small business, they, you know, they can't afford, you know, <laughs> to, you know, some guys, you know, some guys, Gibson 59, Les Paul worth half a million dollars gets a burn in it. And they go, oh, you said it was safer. And they go, you know, they got to pay half a million. They don't have that kind of money. I know that's an absurd situation, but they said they really didn't want to go on the record saying that. What's funny to me about that is, is, um, I, so I'm telling you that they don't say that, as far as I know, they don't say that publicly, that they are safe, um, which I think is responsible of them. I understand where they're at, um, but I've never had a bad experience, and none of, no one I've ever met has had a bad experience with their hangers. But Gibson's new guitar stands use string swing hangers, and Gibson's saying it's safe for nitrocellulose lacquer. So obviously Gibson's stating it for swing swing, string swing. So there you go. <laughs> So if I was a horrible person, I would say, get a string swing, hang on your wall, and if you burn your lacquer, uh, get the guitar stand from Gibson and put your guitar on that and then tell Gibson that their stand did it. I, that'd be horrible. Don't do that. Uh, so, so, all right. On that note, I want to button up the show. I want to apologize. I'm pretty sure I missed a bunch of things. Um, and... I apologize for what I missed. I try to get all the ones I can, but you know, the show can only go so long. I hope you guys enjoyed the guitar of the week. Um, we will be on the same time next week. Last week, of course, was pre-recorded. I didn't tell anybody because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So that's what we do if I miss the show now is I pre-record it real quick uh, and put it out. That's what's great about you guys. I, I go through old shows. I find the comments I missed from other shows. I find Patreon comments and I put together a show. And I, I do that show. So, you know, when you see the pre-recorded ones, you understand it just for the record is not edited. It's just like this. I just didn't have viewers in front of me at the time. So it's the same thing. All right. Also, I uh, would appreciate it if you guys check out the second channel. Uh, it would be great. And uh, and if you check out and subscribe uh, to the Phil McKnight 2 channel, um, 15,000 subscribers sounds amazing, but 20,000 sounds more amazing. <laughs> and if you wouldn't mind subscribing to this channel, if you haven't, uh, I'd like to get to 400,000 subscribers um, for no reason whatsoever. <laughs> Actually, I'll tell you. Okay, I'll end with that note. I'll be as honest. This is as honest as I can all ever be, Okay. 
I only want to get to 400,000 subscribers because when you get in between numbers, like I got at three, I'm 380,000. Every once in a while, somebody will talk to me and they'll go, how many subscribers do you have? And I can't say 388. I can't. Like, I, I can't go, oh, I have 388,000. I go, and I can't say 400,000 because that's that I'm, I'm lower. And I go, so I say 300,000. <laughs> so if you get me 401,000 subscribers, I'll get to tell people I have 4,000 subscribers. Um, and by the way, the only people that ever ask me that are young people. <laughs> they go, how many subscribers do you have? And you tell them, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, I thought you were like nerdy and not cool. And I'm like, I am but there's 400,000 nerdy, uncool people too with me. Okay, they're cool, but they're with me. All right, guys, on that note, I'm gonna let you guys go. You guys have an amazing weekend. Play some guitar, and I'm gonna look around until I find this, this screen that lets me in the show. There it is. All right, guys, thanks for your time. The Know Your Gear Podcast.